So, big things going on tonight. Uh, we're celebrating Mel Brooks' birthday, of course. He's 89. It's Holy like... crap, I mean, he's still walking. <laughs> uh, I don't think you can use your legs at a certain age. Necessarily, Matt. Well, I'm not saying that they would just pop off. Um, they would just become weak and decrepit and crumble underneath you, you know? Well, they'll just, they'll just, they just melt into jelly after you reach 60, typically. Unless you take, you know, special rich person pills. Or now, like, next year, if he, if he manages to get at 90, he'll be at the age where you're not allowed to, like, have, like, expose air on him, or else, like, you, you could just blow on him and he'll be like... <laughs> wait, 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 wait. What if it's just, like, Futurama where his head is in a jar and he has, like, legs underneath that move around? I'm mm. still doing comedy, even in the future! Expertly delivered. We, we need to do that, because we need Mel Brooks alive. For life. Yeah. yeah. Without Mel Brooks, there is no sunshine. There can be only one. They're here! I have come here to chew bubblegum and kick ass. And I'm all out of bubblegum. Go ahead. Make my day. Cinema Royale. Hello, welcome to another new episode of Cinema Royale. I'm your host, Mike Mixtape. It is June 28th, 2015. It's Mel Brooks' birthday. We're going to celebrate his birthday by talking about his films. Uh, let's, let's get started with my as you can see morgan could do that like a little bit further from the mic there morgan <laughs> it's not exactly a triumphant note to start on that's nothing you should you should hear me when i blow my nose that was my no we should because that's not entertaining podcast material matt what yeah, you never know <laughs> what i can't hear you i'm deaf now <laughs> Hey, you want to know how to make this thing dance? Put a little boogie in it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no. <laughs> That's the end of the podcast. Good night, everybody. That's charming. <laughs> Fantastic. <clears throat> let me, let's start, uh, let me introduce you to my awesome film, Fishiados, where everybody's here for the first time since God knows when. Oh, my God. It's been a crazy couple of weeks or so. Oh, my God. So... Let's start off with the first Canadian to my left, my side, not to your view, Matt. What the fuck now? It... Cheeseburger. It's a full yard session. <laughs> Welcome to Cinema Royale. Any more inappropriate sound effects you want to put in? Really? Tonight... Tonight we are going into the Congo and stacking us a, hippop a hippopotamus and raspberries for every button. Clearly, <laughs> Mike the cat is the least of our problems. No, with these no, hooligans. no, no. I thought it was going to be way worse, but no, no, no. These guys fucking everything up. <laughs> okay. This is what happens when you do things live. Live. That's why I'm. That's why editing Mike. Say hi to the editor because he's going to cut everything out. Oh, you suck! <laughs> We're giving you gold here. You just don't understand it. Okay. Hold on. Okay. Ugh. Let me take. Let me take that back again. God damn! I'm not doing the whole thing again. Let me just. Let's start this off. Let me introduce you to my awesome film aficionados. First up, we've got the smart ass over here, Matt Bruneo, known as. <laughs> Okay, somebody's doing this on purpose. <laughs> what is hey guys. going on? <laughs> Sorry I couldn't make it last time. I went on a surprise trip to New York City, and it was really awesome. But now I'm back, and I'm ready in action. So I'm prepared to talk about movies. What, what we got? Oh, yes, Mel Brooks. Got it. <sighs> wow, what a thrilling episode this has become to be. Next... <laughs> Next, we've got uh, our favorite from the East Coast, uh, Morgan Ledger. I just, want, I just want to say very briefly, no, I'm not going to do that voice. Um, 
I'm looking at That's a voice. <laughs> Jeff Goldblum. Shut up. Oh, uh, that, that's, that's chaos theory. Um, I'm looking at the latest issue of Entertainment Weekly, and there was this thing on the back called The Bullseye with Pop Culture. And unfortunately, I'm going to have to spoil this, but um, I was waiting this for the end, because look what made the center. Who is that? I can Five barely... Five-O? What's Five-O doing there? Raveheart? Is that is that that's not a new Entertainment Weekly? That's James, James Horner's Horner. iconic. Oh. oh. I get it now. We will discuss the man later on. That, that could have been like what we could have done. Yeah, why didn't we think of that when we were talking about? Hey, what what's what's relevant to film related? Thanks. That was before he died. Shut up. On the other note, oh, I am pissed God. off over the death of Jon Snow. It's not yeah. technically... It's not technically... He's not dead. Yet. Because we haven't I'm seen the body. There's still several ways in which he could come back. You know, book fans have been mulling this over for quite some time. Stop jumping to conclusions, everybody. It's just that it's tearing me apart. It's like one hand with Teezy on one hand. It's like, oh, gonna lead to a reason. What do you see in the vision? All I see is snow with a capital S. You're tearing me apart, Game of Thrones. <sighs> Fuck's sake. At least Stannis died. That's the important thing. Yeah. I know that was also kind of a maybe, but fuck it. Stannis is dead. Ding dong. <laughs> Ding dong. Then we got James Sullivan also known as Homitude. Two Nights Broadcast is brought to you by enough gay pride to fill up an entire bridge and prevent me from getting home today. Cheers. Damn. Uh, fun fact: there, there's, uh, there's been a, there's been a whole uh, pride parade going on in, in the over in San Francisco today. And guess and whatnot, what? Let's so guess it, it blocked the bridge. It is blocked the funny? bridge. <laughs> Dude, you make a Blues Brothers crack, and I'm going over there with a rainbow flag up your ass. A what? I'm not saying anything. Blues Withers? Why are your jokes so Blues Brothers. Today? Oh, Blues Brothers. The, the, the I still don't get that. He's on the bridge, and they... Oh. oh. <laughs> okay. There was a bridge in that scene, but it's not really that related, but whatever. I was going to go driving off that bridge with uh, Tom and Louise, you know. So... Movies with bridges. Inception had a bridge. I love you, James. I love the old team. Nyin, 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 nyin. Nyin, 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 nyin. Sleepy Hollow, that had a bridge. Totally <laughs> relevant. <laughs> a bridge, a bridge too far. There's bridge in the title. There's also and, and there's, there's also, also a bridge to Terabithia. There's also bridge X Men Three. Yeah, there you go. There's X Men Three. Charles always loved bridges. Three. There's a bridge. So that would explain why I'm sitting here in my goddaughter's bedroom. And as you can see, yeah, nothing going on here. But oh, hold on. What? That explains the giant, the giant, uh, Pink generic bear. lots of bear. Yeah. Lots of loving bear. Jeff Bridges. <laughs> he's, a, he's a bridge. There you go. It's totally relevant, James. I'm funny. Uh -huh. How'd you know I was watching Seventh Son today? Hey, I was too. What? I didn't catch the ending, but it was so amazingly bad. Jeff Bridges as Gandalf should have been my sponsor for tonight. Boy, you fell! I want to talk this KFC voice for the remainder of the movie for a reason. Well, I, I gotta see this. It's really hilariously bad. Dude. Hey, anything with anything with Jeff Bridges, I'm game. He can make anything compelling. He wasn't the Fisher King. <laughs> mm-hmm. Last... Come on, Jack, get back to your roots. Ooh, 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 ooh. <laughs> Here's calling me. They told me to get smash paste at the ye old liquor store. <laughs> uh That movie was glorious. And Jada Jada. Yes. 
Oh, <laughs> you're still introducing people, aren't you? I was I waiting for you. I past that. I thought you'd give Your it up. Your line is high. Hi. My computer's fixed. It's been broken for the past, like, four months. Weeks. Or rather, the internet has, which is why I've been absent. But now it's fixed. I'm in another location as a result. But it's, so far, it's working out. Podcast hasn't really officially started yet, but, you know, we'll see. We'll see what happens. Knock on wood. Uh, so yeah, it's Mel Brooks' birthday today. Gotta celebrate. We talk about uh, his iconic uh, films, of course. Um, so let's start with his first film, obviously, uh, The Producers. Yes, The Producers, um, which I believe it began in 1968. I believe. Yep, you are correct. Yes, the 1968 film. Uh, basically, The Producers is about the story about. A Broadway act uh, about this Broadway producer and an accountant, and they're pretty much trying to make the ultimate get rich quick scheme where if they can make, uh, they want to go and make like three million dollars or something like that. But the, here's the thing about Broadway if it's a flop, then the producer would end up keeping all the money, and that's the thing. And then, like, there was an instance when the accountant, Max Bialystok, suddenly realized that technically. A producer can make more money with a flop than he could with a hit. And that's essentially what they were planning out to do, to make the world's worst Broadway show ever made. Like, it would be 100% of a failure. They would get a script. They would go get the worst script, the worst director, the worst actors, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, this would result to make them to make the Broadway show springtime for Hitler, uh, which is pretty much... A glo like this entirely glorified Broadway show of uh, Hitler, which, which where it came, where, which the song "Springtime for Hitler" came out. But as you guys may know, throughout its history, um, like there are a few adaptations that came out. In 2001, James Brooks has released one of the most uh, successful Broadway shows, the producers of the same name, with Nathan Lane and Matthew Broderick, which ended up winning the most Tonys. Um, for a Broadway show, and in 2005, there is a film adaptation uh, with the same cast, except for with, like with the same cast as the Broadway show, with a few exceptions, like Will Ferrell as uh, Franz Liebken and Uma Thurman as Ula. And um, I'm going to be very honest with me. Uh, I'm going to be very honest here that the producers is one of my favorite movies. It's just really hilarious and a lot of fun but here's the biggest catch and please guys let me explain i'm not referring to the 1968 film i'm actually referring to the 2005 musical i oh well there's an easy explanation for that you're just mistaken i'm not alone here no. thank you matt no because Boy. here's the thing here let me explain jada you just shut up Okay, here's the thing. I was introduced, like, I did not have any knowledge about it whatsoever, about the producers. I only knew it from the 2005 musical, and I just adore it. It's just so much fun. I am a Broadway fan myself. Um, I do like, I, I really do love the performances. Like, it's just amazing from Gary Beach uh, to, um, hold on, sorry. Let me just get some of the cast. Yeah, like, from... From Nathan Lane, Matthew Brodzik, Gary Beach, Roger Bart. It, it's just, everything about it is just so fun and enjoyable and really upbeat. Um, I have seen later on the 1968. There's just, I don't know, like, I was introduced to it. Like, I felt there was something missing. Like, I'm not saying it, like, the 1968 one is bad. Like, it's definitely, it's, it's like they're two different things. That's the thing. Like, I understand, like, how that one is funny, but I, I honestly, I have to check the 1968 producers uh, again as its own thing and not, like, a, a different form of producers because I'm sure it's definitely a hilarious thing. And, uh, and like, there are some memorable moments in there. But for me, the producers is just a lot of fun. Now, before <laughs> any arguments come out, I do understand the critiques that do come out of it. Um, I do understand that... Um, like, since it is a direct adaptation, and I have seen the Broadway show, and I do agree that, like, the Broadway show is ten times better, 
and a lot of the jokes and stuff like that they do work much better in the broadway show but as it is, as a direct adaptation it still works pretty well and i just and i got to say i really really adore the songs like they really are some of my favorites from keep it gay we can do it springtime for hitler like a lot of it is just so much fun in fact i actually know by heart uh, one of the ending songs when Max Bialystok is in jail. I, I can actually, I'll, I, I'll actually just end this off before we change the next subject. So that's pretty much my say. Okay. Would anyone else well, like to debunk Matt? Oh, go on. Uh, crap. Go uh, here it comes. <laughs> well, if you want my opinion, the producers was of the Mel Brooks movies I saw it's probably the most recent one I saw it after Spaceballs and Blazing Saddles and all that other stuff so I did compare it subconsciously to the later works that he had and it's you can definitely tell that it's Mel Brooks' first movie because there are certain elements that just aren't quite in sync yet but you can also tell why it's the movie that made him you know Mel Brooks the star that he is and it is. It's his first, like, really big success, and it's what led to the opus of Young Frankenstein and, and Spaceballs and all that stuff. It's a brilliantly witty movie. It's, it's got great performances from the dude who plays Hitler in the play, who's amazing, and I'm stunned that he's not in more movies, or wasn't in more movies. He was in barely anything after the producers. And that's not justice, because that was a career-making performance right there. To, to the, the humor that, that you would later see in his other movies like the the fast pace and the cartoonishness and the the ridiculousness and zaniness of the plot and how they just run with it my favorite thing about the movie and probably the thing that makes me love it instead of just liking it is gene wilder as max oh yeah what what's his name i don't know he's his he's gene wilder leo 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 bloom leo I love bloom that. <laughs> I think I might have mistaken during my explanation, so I apologize. Yes, you Definitely. did, but I'd love to. I'd like you do that. In... I Sorry. love Gene Wilder so much, so you guys. Gene Wilder is the best. He's just so full of energy and so full of class, but so freaking hilarious in everything he does. And he's got range. Even though a lot of his performances are similar, he's still got a really wide range. And his performance in The Producers might be my favorite performance of his, like, of all time. He plays like this uber neurotic lawyer type who's like got this security blanket and these panic attacks that he has. And he's like really antisocial. And part of me thinks that I should be, you know, upset with such a depiction of that kind of personality. But I'm not. Because it's, it's not only not really that over the top, but it's also really, really cleverly done and really, really fun. His character is just so likable and so sympathetic. And he has the funniest scenes in the movie, by far. Any scene with anything funny happening, just watch his reactions, and that's probably the best part of it. Gene mm. he... It's, it's the movie that made his career, as well as Mel Brooks's. Zero was already, like, doing other movies, and he probably didn't... I don't think he actually did a whole lot after the producers, but Gene Wilder, that's the movie that made him, like, go... Boo! And you can see why, because it plays to all his strengths, you know? That is the... The... Gene Wilder movie to watch if you want to know what's so likable about Gene Wilder. I don't know. So much, so much energy, so much personality, so much. I don't know about the. I mean, there are others. Oh. Not, I'm not saying it's it's that there aren't others, but I'm saying if you want to know what made Gene Wilder the great actor that he's known for, the producers is probably your best bet. And also Willy Wonka, but you know. Yeah. Oh, there we go. There it is. There. But they, they took this, this actor who brought all this energy and charisma and uniqueness to the role and made the character the, the just ball of funny that he was, and they replaced him with Matthew Broderick. Thank you. Thank so... you, David. The, the acting epitome of bland. Yes. Like it's like rep it's like replacing chocolate ice cream with bread pudding. Lies. Not bread pudding, but literally liquid bread. Lies. 
Okay. Like, there's, even even in his good movies, he's not likable. He can't act. Everybody no. knows he can't act. What, 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 what about Simba? Simba was Ooh. a... No, 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 no. Exactly. Like, if you just wait, wait. watch Simba's facial expressions, he's not exactly giving a lot of emotion to the performance. He, it's the writing and the animation that makes Simba likable, not Matthew Broderick. Come on. Broderick's career ended in 98. After 98, he went downhill. Anything before 98, it was perfect. It was not perfect. He he did he did I, okay. Ferris Bueller. I, I wouldn't say perfect okay. then. I I wouldn't say Freaking, perfect then. I. Inspector Gadget was before 98. No, it was 99. Are you sure? Yep. It was 99. Yeah, I did my research. 99. I know my <laughs> research. All the same. All the same. But... Just, 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 Gene Wilder, Gene Wilder, Matthew Broderick. I can't, yeah. I can't think of a movie replacement cast that's so from the, good to bad. I can't think of any more extreme examples yeah, the of that. I, Matthew I agree. Broderick, Matthew Broderick works, I think, because uh, so so what if he's he's not as extreme as as Gene Wilder? You know, G Gene Wilder has has this to his performance. He's also got the hair on top of his zaniness. Um, I guess. The reason why the reason why I thought Matthew Broderick's performance worked is because he doesn't have to be the same Leo Bloom. He Thank really you. doesn't. He, in fact, I I'd, I'd say that that's actually one of his better better performances. You know why? Thank you. Exactly. Because because he's he was working on it for how many years up to that point? Well, he already did four years. Know. He already did. Yeah. Really he was already Leo Bloom for four years. Exactly. He's had four years to iron everything out, and you know, watching, you know, watching the film. Maybe it is because I watched the movie first, but I, I, I felt like, I, I felt like it was hugely underrated. I mean, I was in the audience, I was in that audience in that theater, and it was, yeah, it was mostly. I know the movie didn't do too well, but the audience that I had was mostly pop populated with folks who were much, much older, probably fans of the old producers, or people who saw the play. And by the end of it all, they were laughing. It was a great crowd. We were laugh. We were laughing hysterically. Some of those guys were rolling, rolling in the, in the, in the aisles. You know, I had a, I had a good fun time with the movie. Uh, the original producers, it it's so it's just sort of okay to me. But it, but when you take out the music, that's what that's to me that's what that what that's what makes the story bland. That's exactly how I feel, honestly. You're, you're ignoring the historical context of the producers. The producers introduced a style of comedic movie that shaped you're also not forgetting the historic. You're also forgetting the historic context of the Broadway show, which led to the movie. It's not forgetting the historic context. It's not exactly history. It's the early 2000s. And the Broadway show, you know, was better, but... You know, Broadway has Broadway has certain different standards when it comes to adapting things. You know, it's it's a different kind of playing field. It's a different environment. Now, if I just may add one more thing about Matthew Broderick <laughs> is that, like, of course, it, it's like what I said before is that it's better not to compare the two different producers. With Matthew Broderick, I do agree with James that this is definitely one of his better performances of the uh, like of the post 2000s mostly because like a lot of people say that yes matthew broderick is awkward he can act weird but like in this one he really takes it to his major advantage like here you have leo bloom which pretty much encompasses this awkward nerdy like character and like like he really brings out his like his own charm and magic to him like anything like he pretty much takes all his negative aspects completely upside down and makes this charming and lovable character. And it's just a lot of fun. Even, like, I could argue that, like, Matthew Broderick really does have some good reactions to it, just like Gene Wilder, actually. Like, there, like, there are some really, really hilarious moments, especially when Max B. Hostock would take his blanket. That is, like, that is a true highlight of one of, uh, 
Matthew Broderick's uh, performance in the mo in, in this movie. Gene, Wa Gene Wilder did it better. It's hard so? not to make the comparison. They're the same exact character. No, they can't be exactly the same. But if one of them is vastly inferior to the other, you're going to notice. Oh, boy. Okay. What was that? Oh. Did, something, did something beep? Is that the oven? No, that's the security in this house. Ah, oh, crap. Oh, are you, be are you being robbed? Can I watch? No. It, it, it just, uh... It, it, it's just a security alarm. It, it, it goes it goes off when something so much as budges outside the house. They didn't like what you said about Gene Wilder. <laughs> exactly. Hey, we're um, not saying that what Gene Wilder okay, we can did argue is that. bad. What's all, right, going on? All, right, all right, all right, all right. Let me talk. Okay. Me too. Mike has something to say. You want to go first, Morgan, or should I? Um, I'm just going to be very brief. Here's my problem. It's hard to compare these two because you got one... That was the original, and I freaking love that, by the way. I just love the absurdity, the the interest. Just everything about these two guys, now they play off each other. You have Zero Mustel being Max Bialystok, and now he's all greedy and curmudgeon-y, and in the end, they both trade personalities, so you have Zero, sorry, sorry Max, going from this very greedy, curmudgeon kind of person to understanding, you know, the aspect of love and everything, and Leo Bloom in the other corner le learning that he has to be a little, you know, greedy and decisive as well. So there's that interesting switch off right there. The movie musical, this is the problem I have. I rented the movie a while ago. Okay, maybe I should backtrack a little. There was one instance where I rented it for the seventh or eighth time in the library, just because I was bored and I was house sitting, and I listened to the audio commentary. And I'm going to say mm -hmm. right now, worst audio commentary ever. The director was so specific. She was detailing things like they were listing off of a trivia site rather than going into the detail of the backgrounds and everything. It was more very robotic. It was sort of like, oh, here is the scene where Max feels betrayed and stuff. It was like Data trying to do an audio commentary. It is that bad. Like, there's no Data? Sounds. Data. Like data. 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 Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. I'm from Massachusetts, I have different pronunciations. Um, and that's my problem. Because it's being shot like it's being performed as the musical, because it's being perceived and executed like it was the, the Broadway show, this is my problem. It's like I'm watching a video brochure to see the Broadway show as opposed to experiencing the movie. Those shots are so static. When we see those sets, they're obviously built sets like as if they just took them straight from the stage show, plopped them in front of the camera and said, okay, let's shoot the movie around this. No creativity, no fun. No, wait, the only time they actually do get creative is like that when um, along came Bialy number. That was fun. Like the choreography and stuff, but that's the problem. It is crafted just like the stage show, like something that you would see along the lines of Cats or Joseph and the Technical or Dreamcoat when they made those, like, straight video. And that's the feeling I get when I see this. Like, there's moments where after a song, they pause. They pause. Like, they're looking for a laugh or an applause or something. And that makes me want to see the show more than actually appreciate this movie. And it gets under my skin. And I feel so bad because I'm really mixed about the movie musical. I want to like it. I like the numbers except for uh, what's that number? Uh, something uh, keep it gay, keep it gay, keep it gay. Or keep it mm. gay. Oh, I get really? it. I oh, get well. it. They're, they're, they're doing a parody of all the, the stereotypes and stuff but it's so annoying. I get the joke. It was funnier in the movie because it was straight to the point. We don't need to have all these over-the-top lipsticks and these people with giant crotch bulges. In, in, the, in the original movie, it was sort of ambiguous as whether or not he was gay or just really quirky. In the, in the yeah. play, no, no, gayness is funny. Let's make it about that. Yeah. Gay people, they're so bright and happy. They wear rainbows. Da, 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 da. Ugh. But that's one of the more enjoyable bits of the movie. No. The only no. positives is expanding the character of... At least that is one slight thing I do slightly agree with. It was a Thank little you. funnier... Shut up. In the original film, it was kind of funnier having her as that crazy secretary or whatever. 
in this film, there's an obstacle for Leo and Max to deal with. Yeah. It sort of works, but at the same time, it's like, I want to see the blowing up the theater ending, because it's so funny the way that uh, okay, um, yeah. Kenneth Mars, because the way Kenneth Mars plays off of these two characters, you're like, I don't think I know which one of these two. Either this is the this is a quick fuse or something else, and he lights the wrong fuse. He's like... Oh, it's a quick fuse. <laughs> yeah. It's a quick fuse. It's hilarious. It's hilarious. It was, oh, I got more laughs out of the original movie than I did with the 2005 version. Needless to say, I do like what they were doing, and I like Mel Brooks' cameo at the post credit. but other than that, I just want to see a performance at a high school musical more than the Broadway version because I have no monies. Oh. <laughs> uh, 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 uh. Well, it's uh, not even on Broadway anymore. It's very sadly, but... Seriously, and seriously, like... watch that movie again, and I want you to do me a favor. Tally the amount of times they pause at the end of a number. I swear to Christ, they do it so often in that film. And the deleted scenes fucking count. I Jesus. I believe you. I I what okay, for one thing, I like I I I like the I like the the stage like the stage like staging of it all. But I understand I understand where you're coming from. Okay. And another thing too, I appreciate the fact that Nathan Lane and Matthew Broderick are reprising their characters. I have no problem against that, but I just don't think they're funny. I feel like they're imitating the originals from the film. I know they're from the stage play, but it's not working. Like there's okay, that scene that... where you have there's that scene where Matthew's character Leo Bloom is freaking out because his blanket is taken. In Gene Wilder's version, he is manic. He's like a fucking muppet. He's using his hands. He's going, my blanket! He's like ready to claw out Max Bialyshock, and it's so funny because he's having this little tamper tantrum. You don't know if he's gonna tear him to bits. What does Matthew Bloom do? He shakes his head, says a bunch of gobbledygook. Here you go. That is not threateningly funny. That is just childishly funny. The Gene Wilder version represented like an actual like psychotic break and that was what made it so funny the the matthew broderick version was tame by comparison although for the record while i am always here for some matthew broderick bashing i want to make it clear nathan lane is awesome agreed thank you I, I, yeah. thank you great Every tarnishing nathan lane the birdcage is a classic you need to watch it if you haven't so mm. my daughter my daughter uh, yes, uh, Nathan Lane, the straightest gay man in all of Hollywood. Uh, yeah. But, um, but yeah, the, the other point that I wanted to bring up, and, and, uh, I, I, the, the character of Ula, I, I thought that she was actually a character in the 2005 version. In the, in the, 1968 version it's hard to call her a character because she's really she's she's a running gag and it, it yeah. it's kind of it, it's it's actually kind of it's actually kind of aggravating because you're uh you're 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 just sort of looking looking at this character like they're like they're uh like they're a, an ornament a, a dancing ornament that you that you put up at Christmas time. <laughs> but that's not uncommon. Not uncommon that's... with Mel Brooks movies to have that kind of humor. And you know, I don't, I don't, I, I, I do appreciate expanding the female character, but I don't really mind how it was in the original. It wasn't really mm -hmm. a huge issue that I had. Even though she's a terrible dancer. <laughs> Say what? She I, was a great dude. She, she dances like oh, I do. Dogs on fire! That's pretty Same much how time. I dance. I just wiggle my arms. Woohoo! Yeah. So, uh. I would say so Uma Thurman is better, but she had a dance devil, so. Uh. Anyway. Mike? I've been holding it in. Alright, I've seen. I watched the producers today after I watched my film, and. I thought it was great. Gene Wilder's pitch perfect in the role. I mean, mad crazy. And, uh, Ula. Oh, she, she seems like the best, like, almost the best part. Not really. I mean, she's, I like that gag. It was just, just like, oh, she was Swedish because she couldn't speak English. It was just like, uh, 
Go to work. Go to work. <laughs> I just thought it was fucking hilarious. I was laughing my ass off that part. Uh, because that's it was because he won because um, Max wanted to uh, spend some money on a uh, on a toy and the toy was Ula. So it was just like and when I saw the 2005 version, I was like, wait, wait, Ula's expanded with Uma Thurman, and she speaks English like like a broken English like what? I mean, I I would I would have thought Uma Thurman would be like not speak English and try to stay true to the character. Um, Nathan Lane, Nathan Lane in the 2005 version is good, but I prefer Zero's performance better than Nathan Lane. It was kind of weird seeing Nathan Lane and Matthew Broderick together since uh, The Lion King, because Timon and uh, Timon and uh, Simba Simba. together. And then there's also that deleted scene that included uh, Ernie as a, yeah, as a I, bum in the bar, and it like it's yeah. all three of them reunited. <laughs> you mean they good. cut out the bit of? Yeah, they did. Yeah, so so Timon, Pumbaa, and Simba were on live all together since then on the same screen, which was pretty cool. I thought it was that pretty cool. But the 2005 version it was a direct, like, adaptation. Like, I was like, comparing the two because it, it was, like, word for word. Like, I was like, the hell? Like, and I just thought, Matthew Broderick as a Leo, oh my god, no. No, 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 no. I cringed when I saw him with the baby blanket. I was like, give me my baby blanket. Give me my baby blanket. Uh-huh. Like, I was like. Mm. I'm in pain. I'm in pain. Like, seriously, what's up with that nasally voice? Yeah. I was like, what did you do to the character? I have... King Wilder. That's I have how he talks. I have a theory. Yes, it's how he talks, and that's the problem. Every movie he's been, he always has this positive chipper attitude. Even in <laughs> Godzilla 1988, you can tell he's like being like very upbeat and robust. And that's not the problem. We need someone to be like happy, sad, angry at times, or even marveling at this giant monster. It's a cruddy movie, but you know, I have a guilty pleasure mm-hmm. for it. Seriously, right. he has like this very nasally voice whenever he like whines or needs to emote anger. And it doesn't work. Ferris no. Bueller's Day Off is probably the only time I actually felt like I was watching a full-fledged character. Lion King, mm-hmm. I gotta rewatch that again. Is I don't know. I think he's okay. I remember Jason Taylor Thomas a bit more as young Simba, but other than that, I don't think he's a bad actor. I just need to see him in a good movie. Yeah, exactly. It's just I was like comparing the both movies. I was like, what? The? I mean, I didn't. I knew it was a musical. I know it was adapted from the musical. I have not seen the musical. I don't know it. So I didn't know the songs. And I was like, what is this musical number? Wait, they're, they're, I, I, yeah, it was a music, movie musical. And I'm not a huge fan of music, movie musicals. I watch them occasionally. But when I saw the producers, I was just like, hmm, what am I watching? It's like, I liked it, the original version, better because it was like no musical numbers and it was easy to follow the story. Oh, and... well, there you go. It had springtime for Hitler. Yeah, the, oh yeah, obviously the springtime for Hitler bits were amazing. Oh my god, LSD is Hitler. Yes. He, I, he's, I, how? How did he not best. have a career after that? He was, I was so I was like, great. Hey, hey, hey. He was in Mad, 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 Mad World. Uh, oh, okay, I'll give, I'll, I'll, I'll give the original. We're talking about, he, yeah. we're talking about Snow Miser as Hitler. Oh my god, he was so great. Hey, man. <laughs> You're German. <laughs> I'm German. We're all, We're German. all German. That means we can't attack Germany. Germany. Best part. All my I friends like... are here, man. <laughs> baby. Baby. Oh, baby. Baby? What is this baby? I kind of want to see an entire play about Hitler starring that guy. Is it just me? Yeah, just... I would watch that. <laughs> I would, I would totally watch this. Hold on, what, well, like, I think they tried say. something like that one time. It was called Heil Honey, I'm Home. Ouch! Whoa. That was insane. I just, I was about to say, like, <laughs> like, it was... like that was great, but like, I still like, like, I, I still really enjoyed like Gary Beach when he, when he was Hitler in like the Springtime for Hitler show. Like that was still fun. That was still a lot of fun to watch. He wasn't terrible. 
Yeah. Come on. It's, it's it well, you guys are exaggerating as hell. Oh crap. How is he wasn't terrible in exaggeration? If anything, it's the. Well, <laughs> oh, he was fun. He was fun. He he was a fun Hitler at Compared the least. Compared to LSD, yeah. he wasn't terrible. Yes. Compared to LSD, which is a clever fucking name. I find it weird that we're talking about LSD being Hitler. <laughs> I know, right? Like... Context, Morgan. Stay in the context. I'm just gonna watch Bill Cosby and Hitler. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, <laughs> the producers. Great star for Mel Brooks, but uh, eventually. I just, I just gotta say, at the end of the day, that. For everyone, everyone watching this, like watch both, like watch them both, but individually. Do not yes. do any comparisons, or else crap like this happens, where friends become enemies, and like, and all we do is bicker and argue about who did it better, whose dick is bigger, and stuff like that. They're both Over good the as baby. their own things, but don't compare right. to, both. To quote, to quote Mel Brooks. Don't be stupid, be a smutty, come on, enjoy the podcast potty. Exactly. <laughs> oh, we'll, we'll get into that. Especially uh, that that line keeps coming up in his other films anyways. I'll, I'll mention it when we get into that. Uh, so, we, in our podcast, we go from the producers to Blazing Saddles, I believe. I don't... Yeah, wait, I think... That's me! I'm right. doing Blazing Saddles. What? I can double check. Mongo. What? Yeah, pretty much. Unless anybody is taking 12 chairs. No. I, I, I was. I was talking about later. Yeah, Blazing Saddles, Farting Cowboys. Uh, Excuse me while I whip this out. <laughs> I love Blazing Saddles so much, you guys. Oh, I, God, I love it too. It, it, is, it is Mel Brooks' take on the Western genre. Because Lord knows he's done several movies that have been different takes on different genres. Sci-fi. We'll get into that. Horror, monster. And this is Western. Blazing Saddles. And the story of Blazing Saddles is... <laughs> essentially, there's this really rough and tumble little town. And there's this guy who wants to build... I don't know, what is it? An oil company? Some kind of corrupt thing. Over the town. So what he, he's doing is... He's the town to... Be run amok with crimes so that the people will evacuate. But the people, because the people feel corrupt, what is that noise? Why is it raining on my parade? Is that a baby crying? That's not me. Where's the baby crying? James? Are you aware of the I, baby I muted my microphone there so you wouldn't have to hear that. I... Ow! That's my... Hey. That's my goddaughter throwing a rebellion in the next room. Uh... She's not a teenager yet, obviously. So... As I was saying... You? The people of the rough and tumble town, they need a new sheriff. So... The corrupt guy calls upon the mayor and suggests that he get a sheriff. The idea being that he gets a sheriff that the town will never accept. Now James isn't moving. Nick. Go on, just go on. Uh, whatever, go on. whatever. Just, Who needs him? Don't. Yeah. Just ignore him. So. He's got tentacle. James, we'll miss you. We'll, uh, just continue and I'll fix the situation. So they call upon a black man. Because this is the old west and people don't like black men. Who's about to get hung for like being sassy and stuff, but they delay that order and tell him that he can go be a sheriff at this town. So the movie is basically him going and cleaning up the town and beating all the odds through his wacky wise cracking bugs bunny ways. You know? Fighting against racism and corrupt executives and, you know, Madeline Kahn breaking the fourth wall and that's really the, the best plot summary I can give before it goes completely off the rails because it's such a crazy movie you guys I won't even bother addressing the ending have you come to join us yeah. last game is everything alright why are you rocking are you having a Just psychotic break 
Yes, because I want to. <laughs> My God, what is this? <laughs> Uh, I can't really do it because mine makes noises. <laughs> you trying to ruin the podcast here, people? Come on. Okay, keep. We were talking about Blazing Saddles. Yes. Uh, uh, yeah. Blazing Saddles is well known for having a lot of really, really witty political type humor. Not political, but it addresses things like racism. Like in a, a, com- a, like a social, co- like a commentary. Yeah, social commentary. It addresses things like racism and racism, a lot of racism. Yeah, mm-hmm. uh, and and uh, did I mention the racism? Yeah, it deals with a lot of that stuff, but it doesn't do so in like a really serious way. It it, it does so in a really over the top, satirical, mm-hmm. parody Looney Tunes kind of way. And the character of oh my god, I'm totally blanking on his name. Character of Black McSheriff. Hold on, I'll look it up. Black Bart. Yeah, that's it. Looking it up. Boop, boop. We're yeah. professionals. Anyway, the, yeah. the, the, the point is his character is really carrying the movie. I mean, there's a lot of great side characters going on. There's Madeline Kahn playing. One of the best female characters in Mel Brooks movies. Like you talk about how the producers barely had a female character, Madeline Kahn, makes up for that in Spades, even though she's only in like half the movie. But still, and of course, Gene Wilder comes back as like this. Mm-hmm. The Wacko Kid. The Wacko Kid, Mongo, of course. <laughs> Kenny Graham from Mongo. <laughs> Mongo, great- I like candy. Uh, this makes history, too, because apparently this is the first movie, marks the first time the sound of farting has been used in the film, so the first fart joke was in this movie. That is history. That is some groundbreaking stuff right there. Well, Psycho was the first one to have a toilet, so there you go. Really? This one? It's been a... Like, honestly... It's been... yeah, Yeah... The fart joke's been around for 41 no, years. No, but I'm surprised it didn't come out earlier. No. Well, there is a fun tidbit about that. The first recorded fart was in 1900 by Thomas Edison. Ah. So it was around in 1900, but in 70, 1974, Mel Brooks like, let's put a fart joke in there. Because hmm. uh, the, the trivia is that in old westerns, they would eat like beans and all that stuff. And, you think beans would give you gas, but no, not, they don't fart in the movies, but Mel Brooks thought it was funny to put the farting noises, because, of course, beans give you gas. Blazing Saddles is probably the zaniest of the Mel Brooks movies, and that's saying something. It's it's definitely the most fourth wall breaking, and possibly yes. the most akin to... Lo- they literally have a scene where Bart, like, gives a bomb to Mongo, pretending to be, like, a candy gram man in true Looney Tunes fashion, and then he walks away, and you hear the Looney Tunes theme start playing, like, do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do, as he walks away. Like, they're literally acknowledging that he's Bugs Bunny. And that's pretty great, you know? I mean, you had black characters in the old Looney Tunes cartoons, but none that you would see, like, aired today, because they were always, like, uh, portrayed kind of off, you know, from the 50s and all that. So, like... When you see, first of all, you rarely see this kind of character in live action form. Because it's really, really, really hard to do Looney Tunes-esque humor in live action. And Blazing Saddles is one of the very few successes in that department. But the character of Bart, he's not only a live action Bugs Bunny type character who works really well, but he's also of color. And that makes him really unique in a lot of ways, you know? And it, And it... Some of the more off-color jokes, I think, get forgiven for this reason, because there's clearly... Th- there's, like, you, there's know, you know that it's done with heart. Yeah. You know, there, there, there's a lot of love to be found in the movie, and a lot of really silly stuff. And it's perhaps the most over-the-top comedy I've ever seen, and I just love it. I love it so much, you guys. It is the quintessential Mel Brooks movie. If you want to understand Mel Brooks, watch Blazing Saddles. And you will get it. And if you don't get it, then get it out. 
Then why are you even here? Why are you listening to this podcast? <laughs> yeah, why did you click on this episode if you don't know anything about Mel Brooks? Get the hell out of here. Obviously, go watch some films. Obviously, it was to see my pretty face again. Mm-hmm. I say, I say the me? sheriff is a nerd. What did he say? He said the sheriff's gonna nerd. No, you fool! I said the sheriff's a nerd. <laughs> oh, he's oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Yo, where are all the white women at? <laughs> oh, my! They said you was hung, and they was right. <laughs> oh. Beautiful. It's so beautiful. It's I guess I'm gonna have to rewatch Blazing Saddles. Oh, definitely. Yes, yes, you do. Yes. I don't care if you yes, watched uh... it yesterday, you still need to rewatch it. You know, uh, yeah. it, it's funny because that movie was really hit with a lot of censored notes from the studio, but Mel kept it in. The only thing he did cut from what I heard was a little joke at the end where he's supposedly getting his you-know-what tasted, if you catch my drift. And Mel Khan's character goes, is it true what they say about you? <gasps> it's true, it's true. And then after a beat, you'd hear Blackbird say, I hate to disappoint you, man, but you're sucking on my elbow. It was, it was it was too much and the milk oh. Oh. I was still a funny scene. Madeline Kahn was great. I love Madeline Kahn. She, she was so God. I wish she was still alive. It makes me I'm sad. I'm just so oh. tired of falling in love. In, in terms of crazy books movies, I say Silent Movie is crazier, but it feels restrained. So I do say Blazing Saddles is a far crazier movie because it's taking on racial subjects. But my goodness, so it's Silent... crazier, but it's not crazier. Uh, no, no, no. Silent Blazing Saddles is crazier. The Silent Movie is more like the Diet Coke version. Seriously, they have a wheelchair chasing with Paul Newman, and it's very mm, injury so... and breaking the fourth wall. Mm. That's right, and they have a, and they have a, a Chekhov soda machine fight. <laughs> that is amazing. The way they're using it is like a machine gun. They're firing at the executives trying to steal his movie. So, I wanted to say a little tidbit here. According to Mel Brooks' uh, auto, auto commentary, Warner Brothers released it again in the summer of '75 because they didn't have any other big pictures to release. That popular. Wow. That I can. Huh. Wow. Warner Brothers is like, we don't have any other big pictures. Let's just those blues. I don't have to decide. Hey, screw it. Let's put up Mel Brooks again. Mel, your movie's out again. Oh, great. That's More money wonderful. for me. <laughs> wonderful. I, just that was I was wondering if I would buy this Corvette or not. <laughs> what? I, when you think of Mel Brooks, you think of Blazing Saddles right away. To be honest, like, it's the most iconic movie. Yeah. You can think of when it comes to Mel Brooks. I and, don't know. And... Maybe Spaceballs. Maybe Spaceballs. Yeah. But Spaceballs has Star Wars fame behind it, so it's kind of cheating. Right. Yeah. Right. But uh, it's it's kind of interesting how he parodied the westerns because westerns back in the day were kind of hot, but nowadays they're just kind of dipping. So if you're not a fan of westerns, you can. When was the last time a western was even released that wasn't a remake? Actually, uh, if I may add, checking it now. It is definitely among like amongst like one of the most favorites. Like I'm checking uh, the American Film Institute's list, and they put and for their 100 years, 100 laps, they did put in Blazing Saddles all the way up to number six, right at right mm-hmm. under Some Like It Hot, Tootsie, Doctor Strange Love, Annie Hall, and Duck Soup. What was number one? Uh, Some Like It Hot. Ah. Number one, the one funniest. Marilyn... Yeah. One with uh, number Marilyn one Monroe. was some. Uh, all right, I okay. It does it say? It was a good movie. I don't know about number it one, good. but it wasn't. It wasn't as good Whoa. as Gentlemen <laughs> Prefer Blondes. Oh look, the producers is at number eleven. Which, Which producer is that? No, you come on. I don't even have to say it. You all know what it is. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, okay then. I wouldn't even have. Like even I know it's the <laughs> 1968 version. Say mad. You are. I know. I mean, I know. I was just gonna say because I know you're the animation guy. How come 
How come you didn't pick Shinbone Alley? Shinbone Alley? I've honestly never heard or heard of Shinbone Alley. Where is it? Uh. <laughs> Crap. Hold on. Is, did he direct it or? He wrote the music for it. Oh, here's a fun fact for you about Mel Brooks. He can't read music, so the way he makes music is humming it into, like, a tape recorder and then hands it off to somebody else to, like, decipher it and make it into what it is. Uh, so, in other words, he's not really a musician. I guess not, because it's since he can't read well, I can't music, find so... Shimbo Nally on his IMDb page. Wait, whoa, yeah. wait, wait. Oh, there it is, Shimbo Nally. Well, he's just the writer, it's not... Yeah, he's a writer. It's not he's not necessarily the director per se. Yes, but it's animated. Was was there yeah. a rule that said it had to be a directed Mel Brooks movie? Well, yeah. Yeah, I guess. And but you, you well, could have picked robots if you wanted to. Yeah, we're talking about anything that Mel Brooks did, like he could okay, direct yeah. it, produce it, write it, be in it, I honestly or whatever. I've never it's... heard of it, actually. I should check See, it out. You, sh you should have done your research, buddy. Me and James were given requests out of the wazoo during season two of All Thing. It really bugged me that much. No, but Mike, just saying, like, when it's Mel Brooks, my mind just immediately is like, I have to do the producers no matter what. I must do the producers. I love the producers. <laughs> right. I, that's understandable, I'm just saying. But, uh, the. What can you say about Blazing Saddles? Because it's just... It's amazing. It's just something you have to see honestly, for yourself. Honestly, I feel like going into detail about what specifically happens would be spoiling it, you know? Because you can't exactly. just be told these things. You need to witness it. Exactly. It's, it's one of those movies you have to watch. Like, if you want to see a farce on westerns check it out but not my favorite mel brooks movie for the record that would be robin hood but still it's up there yeah tights, uh, tights, tights. they roam through the forest looking for fights ow <laughs> so let's just go uh, funny enough mel brooks had two films in 74 which was blazing saddles that was in february was released and then in, in summer of 74, it came Young Frankenstein. Damn, what a year. In black and white, no offense. Mm. Oh, Why white. is that offensive? It's not offensive, it was, black and white. It was That's actual... racist! <laughs> it was an actual line from the trailer. Oh, okay. He was like, come see Young Frankenstein, filmed in black and white, no offense. <laughs> There was another one, uh, I'd like to, I'd like to tell you about a movie of mine called Young Frankenstein, but I don't have the time. That's funny. Oh, man, this movie is great. It is one of my all-time favorite comedies. It's arguably, in my opinion, probably the very earliest horror comedy, but that's up for debate when you have the Adam Costello films, so I'm just gonna say it is the first and possibly... Yes, pretty much the first Mel Brooks horror comedy. And what I find so interesting about this film is that it not only parodies the cliches and story elements from the Frankenstein movies, uh, mostly all, mostly the first three, Frankenstein, Bride of Frankenstein, and Son of Frankenstein, but in a sense, it kind of feels like that lost sequel to the Frankenstein movies, just the way it's shot, paced, and how the characters sort of interact with each other. It's like they know it's a comedy, but they're conveying that it's a classic Universal monster movie. Heck, even the laboratory. The freaking mm -hmm. laboratory. That was the actual laboratory in the previous movies. Hmm. Which makes it all questionably canon, but it's an old book film. Go figure. So you have Gene Wilder in this really insane role as... Um, sorry. In this very insane role as Victor Frankenstein, or Frankenstein. Fre Frederick Fre Frankenstein. Frederick. Well, they got it wrong, didn't they? Um, and you just love this character, how innocent he is, and then he learns that he possesses the knowledge of continuing his grandfather's experiments, and of course, decides to make a monster just because, hey, what the heck? And along the way, there's so many side characters that it's really hard to explain the magic of how hilarious this film is. You have a take on the Igor character, and now he's... An evil character. Now he's Icorn, and he has big puffy eyes and played by Marty Feldman, who's without a doubt one of the funniest characters in the Mel Brooks film. 
Even his oh, introduction God bless you, Marty Feldman. <laughs> even his introduction is just so perfect. Like, you hear, like, these footsteps, and this thunder, and Dr. Frankenstein, it pans out, and you see this creepy, you know, like, in the eyes bulging out, and then Frederick is unfathomed, and he goes, it's Frankenstein, and then Igor blinks for a second, looks at him, and he goes, well, now you're putting me off. <laughs> that is the idea of how this movie plays around with the universal monster cliches. If you, have, if you haven't even seen the original Universal Monster films, in a sense, you kind of do with this film, just the way they play mm -hmm. these things around, like with the blind man played by Gene Hackman. God bless his soul for coming up with the best ad-lib line in all of comic comedic history. Wait, we're going up to the Expresso! <laughs> that was ad-lib? Yeah, that was ad-lib. The, there's this interesting tussle between making this like a universal horror film and a comedy by the way it's shot, the way it's staged, and again just how the story plays out. Like going into this movie you can say it's trying to be like this retelling of the universal monster films, but everything just sort of falls apart because of the cartoony cliches they inject in, which really makes it all the more humorous. But you're expecting like these really serious turns and twists, and then they have like a really funny moment. Like, the whole idea of Frau Blucher, you know, being like the sneaky servant and everything, and Cloris Leachman gets so much great screen time just being mysterious and very provocative, that they have this huge payoff in the end where they have this huge reveal of who she really is, which I'm not gonna spoil because it is comedy gold. And then... It's pronounced Blucher. Um, Madeline Kahn, back again. Oh, yes. Yeah. Mel Brooks loved her and so did I. Oh my goodness, Alan Khan is... Oh, but I forget what's up the fly here. Alan Khan is Elizabeth. Yeah. Is, is it Elizabeth? It is Elizabeth. Uh, oh, I was thinking of Terry Garner for some reason. as Inga. Inga, this... <laughs> Good gravy, what happens to Alan Khan's character is just great. Roll, oh, she's... roll, roll and say, hey, roll, that's, that's, roll. That's, that's Terry Gar. I, I know, I know. Just the idea that it's the cliched 30s kind of scenario where they want to be romantic lovers, but there's no kissing, no touching. I don't even think there is any kissing in the classic 30s and 40s film. That was considered a little risque. So to see her play up, play up to that in this film really makes a nice throwback to it. Like, uh, he can't kiss her, he can't hug her. All they do is an elbow shake and he leaves. It's a great parody of the archetype of the female from the 30s and 40s who pretty much was being like this very innocent, vulnerable kind of character, and then he had Terry Gar, who was like the complete opposite. And that really adds on a lot of the, uh, the flavor there. But the biggest, funniest thing in the whole movie, well, the two things, are Kenneth Mars as a specter, Ken, who has the wooden arm. And sadly, there was a cut scene they had which explains that his character's arm was pulled out of his socket when the first monster arrived, but sadly, I could cut for time strains, you know, see on the DVD. Just the way he uses his arm as, like, a little dartboard and, you know, banging on the on the wall, it makes you wonder how he can't, like, it makes you wonder how he's not cracking his smile or even doing between takes, like, going, like, ow, 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 and he's holding his hand and using it as, like, a batter of ram and everything. <laughs> um, but the biggest breakout character, of course, is Peter Boyley as the monster. Who has to be silent throughout the whole film aside from some rotten rooms. Oh my goodness, this character is just so hilarious. The childlike whim, <laughs> the fact that he reacts to fire like a maniac and kills, nearly kills uh, Frederick over it. And just the idea that he's pretty much the opposite of the original Frankenstein monster. Just how, he's, just how the original Frankenstein monster was menacing and creepy. And yet here, it's the total opposite. You see him as this big kid running around and experiencing things for the first time, like, um, having fun... Don't inhale until the tip blows. Anyway, um... <laughs> <laughs> that was when he was getting his thumb lit on fire. Wow! Just the expressions that Peter Willie does are, like, very Charlie Chaplin-esque. The wide eyes, the screaming... It actually works to its, to its advantage because it's like his own language. Like, you know what the monster is thinking and saying, even though it's all visual. The biggest highlight is where he's on stage performing Put It On The Ritz. Like, you can tell he's saying Put It On The Ritz, but instead it's... <laughs> 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 
Probably. This, this is definitely one of my favorite horror comedies for that reason, because it treads between being an actual universal monster movie and a straightforward comedy, and just seeing these two collide is like an explosive peanut butter and jelly sandwich. For some weird reason, the two actually work to its, work to its value. You have a comedy in one corner and a straightforward narrative of the universal monster films. And, oh my goodness, if you check out the Blu-ray, look at what ended up on the cutting room floor because it is so amazing. Like, I understand why they were cut out for pacing reasons, but good god. They have, like, this long, original, eight-minute opening where they had the reading of the will with all the relatives of Frankenstein minus Frederick, and they had this mm-hmm. record with, um, the original Frankenstein's voice, not Porous Call of somebody else. And it was so funny how they play around with the record, the fact that it skips a lot, and the fact that you need to turn it over to, read, to listen to the rest of it. It was a cute little gag, but I'm kind of glad they cut that out for time reasons, because it's funny, but you're just sitting there waiting for the joke to occur. Where else, the rest of the film, it's really fast-paced, every joke really hits you, and you just can't help but either laugh at it or be like, whoa, did they actually get away with that, or what the heck did they just see? Um, there's really not much else I can say, except it's still alive. I have yet to see the musical, the Broadway musical production, but I will say the music is actually not that bad. Yeah, yes, the Broadway musical. Oh, yeah, I was about to mention that. I was about to mention It's the Transylvania Mania. Yeah, interesting. Yes, brought by... Yes, brought to us by our... From the... Sorry. Um, Interestingly enough, having Roger Bart, who was Carmen Ghia in the in the original Broadway and 2005 movie as Dr. Frederick Frankenstein. And I find it very interesting, like, looking at the reviews and stuff like that, that apparently the reactions were rather mixed. Interestingly enough, and very coincidentally, because they were comparing it to the producers. Isn't that Which a was also familiar, isn't it, people? I actually quite like the young Frankenstein on Broadway. Which Isn't that was ironic? Also, which was also directed by Susan Stroman. Hmm. Jada, just out of curiosity, like, have you, did you see the uh, Broadway version of the producers, or...? I saw part of the Broadway version in pre- preparation for watching the movie, because I never really liked watching a movie adaptation of a Broadway play, but I don't know the context of it. Obviously, there are a few that I watched when I was a kid, like Hairspray in Chicago. But other than that, I like to I like to know what I'm getting into, you know. Especially being no, a Broadway I... aficionado, like I am. No, but so, like yes, I... I've... Yeah. Well, what? No, but like you have to see it fully. It's just like like I said, even I admit that it's actually ten times better than the 2005 version. So it's definitely better than the movie. Of course, that's not you know. Movie adaptations of Broadway plays, they're, they're hard to do. Quite often they'll be, not quite often, but occasionally they'll be good. And, you know, maybe even on par. But very rarely do they surpass their Broadway origins. Because it's a completely different medium. Mm. Friggin' Hollywood. Friggin' oh. Late Miz and Into the Woods, Phantom of the Opera, nonsense. Oh, <sighs> oh come on, that Russell Crowe, though! <laughs> <laughs> this is why we need more movies like Little Shop of Horrors. Sorry, I, I was just joking around. I actually I love, I just love doing uh, the Russell Crowe impression for the stupidity of it. <laughs> in, in the I would like to say... I would like to say there's... I would like to say that there's, uh, since Morgan brought up the de- deleted scenes from the film, there's actually one that I thought that the film could have used, uh, and maybe they cut it out for uh, for uh, for timing purposes. But it kind of explains, it it does a little bit of explaining uh, that the film leaves out uh, in the beginning of the film, uh, Frederick. Frankenstein, Frankenstein does not uh, uh, realizes that he's uh, he's in the footsteps of his 
of his grandfather, the Baron, and he he doesn't like what his grandfather did. But when he but when he uh, accepts, <sighs> when he realizes that he's inherited uh, the Frankenstein mansion, he doesn't. Uh, he doesn't bat an eye. He goes. He takes a train over there, and the rest of the movie takes off. And I thought that was always really curious because, what motivation does he have to go there other than the fact that he owns it? And there's actually a scene that was deleted from the film where he's debating with the uh, with the guy who read him the will that uh, whether whether or not he should go and the one thing that um the one thing that changes his mind is he hears a violin player uh playing the the theme from the film and uh, he takes the violin and he says what music is this and he said it's an old transylvanian lullaby let me see that and then he breaks the violin on his on his knee and hands it back to the guy <laughs> I don't know, I'm kind of glad they cut that out because it sort of ruins the ending and I don't want to give it away but I think it just hints off a little too much to what happens and I think that was the reason why Mel cut it in the first place the one I would have loved to see because there were a couple of ad-lib takes of Marty Feldman taking the brain, Abby Norman mm -hmm. there's a great bit where he pauses no, no, in one take after he drops the brain he goes, well at least I tried, and then he takes the brain I, I wish they used the second take where he says that. He turns, he's about to take the brain, he looks at the camera in a fourth wall and says, Yeah, I know what this, I know, I know, yes, I can read what it says, but we need to make a monster anyway, huh? And he grabs the brain and relieves. Yeah, Marty Feldman, it, the genius of his, of his performance is he's, uh, he's, he's not pretending to have Buckeyes. You know, you can't have you can't pretend to have that, obviously. That's not but, natural. No. Like that's not normal. But he, uh, he he got that, and I read that he got that in a car accident or something of that nature. But he was he was able to take that condition and turn it into comedy gold. Like if uh, he he did. It, I, I think about a third of his performances, period, and I have seen other movies that he's in. I think it, the overall charm of it uh, is, of his performance is probably amplified by, by just that. And I think that he's, when you look at, when you look at uh, Igor characters, or in this case, an Igor character, um, Everyone seems to seems to be more or less parroting um, what what he did. I think. I mean, it, it, there was an animated movie a couple years ago called Igor, which wasn't all that good, but it still still had the titular Igor character uh, with the bug eyes and whatnot. Mm. And so that's. That's what. That's part of why I think Young Frankenstein works. But the other thing I wanted to bring up was um, they they were initially going to uh, when when Gene Wilder first wrote the story, he he, uh, he wrote it down. It was a an eleven page screenplay and must, must have been really really short and. The original that he, the original idea that he had for the ending, and I'm not going to spoil how it ends in the film. I'm going to say, watch it for yourself. It's it's actually a, a beautiful moment that they that they have there. Uh, the the end of the the end of the film, the end of the screenplay originally written was, uh, I think, uh, Gene wrote the story so that the 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 doctor. Uh, ends up dying from uh, diving off of a, a balcony or something like that, along with the monster. It was going to be something more tragic, along the lines of the original, uh, the original Frankenstein films. And I'm 
really glad that they didn't go that route. Because there you can have darkness in, in dark comedies, but there's there's a limit to what you can have there. <sighs> this movie is so quotable. Oh, yeah. It really is. Well, I, I mean, like, honestly, with me, my favorite... Like, honestly, my most memorable moment is, like, when, um... Oh, what was it? When, uh... When, uh... When Frederick, like, he has that realization, and it's, like, that slow pan, and suddenly... At Card Work! It's just amazing. Like, I'm sure everybody has that, like, moment in life where it's, like... You have that genius idea. It's like, no, that's like a moment that's just too genius, and you have to belch it out. Put the candle back. <laughs> yeah, what the whole be behind the bookcase scene, every time I see a movie now that, that utilizes a rotating doorway, a, a, a rotating bookcase, or a rotating wall, or anything like that, I always end up quoting that scene. It's it's a knee jerk reaction. You can't go without it. Uh, so, anything else? I think we're all good. I'm cool. I think, yep, we all said we all we all have our good fill of young Frankenstein. I'm distracted Frankenstein. by our our podcast host who appears to be um. In the dark. Busy trying to call five teenagers with attitude. You know, I, I just realized right so now, sure. it's like if James stole the light from Mike. You're a floating head, dude. You're a floating green head. How does this happen? Uh, I just turned on my light, so what? When did Mike become zombie? <laughs> I was just about. I was just thinking there. Make a like a hi. Make a like a hi. <laughs> keep the jokes coming. Just keep them coming. Just keep them fucking coming. More, keep it I going. I have more Power Rangers jokes, but I'm blanking on the name of the actual character. Is it Zardon? Zordon. Zordon. There, there it is. Zordon. You um, look like Zordon. It's funny. I'm sorry, I just, I'm trying to prepare this uh, next film, which I don't know if you guys have actually seen, because it's not really, it's a film that Mel Brooks produced and starred in back in 83 called uh, To Be or Not To Be. So there you go, I, Matt. Cool. Ooh, actually, I, I'm sorry, as a producer's fan, I just had to do this. To be or not to be, you mean or not to me. Yeah. No, no, it's just, it's not. Can okay. I redo that? <laughs> No. To be you or not to be, you mean a lot to be. Show, show stop our fabulous. Thank you. I'm done. Okay. So what is show? Uh, what, not show stop. What is to be or not to be? That is the question. Hat. 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 All right. Just let me. I've been. I watched the film today. I uh, gathered all the information. Tell us, Zordon. I'll tell you the story of To Be or Not To Be. It is a remake of a 1942 film of the same name, and actually the dialogue is very much the same verbatim. Um, uh, it's about... Actually, I had to look for the summary, because it's very interesting. Uh, during the Nazi occupied of Poland, a acting trope becomes embolished in a Polish soldier's efforts to track down a German spy. Basically, what happened? Well, of course, it's World War Two, and th there's this Polish troop theater going on, and Mel Brooks is in it as one of the main key uh, actors and of the play. And World War Two is happening, and somehow Polish soldiers are talking to this German like spy, and he gets information about the family and the, and the underground resistance, and the soldiers like, oh, I have got to stop him. He's a bad guy, and that subplot goes on, and Mel Brooks comes in, you know, tries to help out, because uh, this Lieutenant uh, Solinsky, not, uh, I know it sounds like 
what you think it sounds like, but it's not. Because here at the Gestapo, we know everything. Yeah, because we know everything at the Gestapo. Um, the title, To to Be or Not To Be, <laughs> comes from... Because uh, Mel Brooks does say the famous quote, To Be or Not To Be, and each time he says it for his play... Uh, a, a lieutenant will walk up and just walk out and go see his wife because uh, she's having a love affair on the side with all the Polish soldiers. I don't know why, but she's a whore. Well, I to mention, it's Anne Bancroft with uh, parentheses earned her name. Yeah, there was a scene where... See the new poster? It's in parentheses. Oh, I... <laughs> And at the end credits, they actually do that too, but in the are like... Uh, it's just... It's a Nazi movie, just like how they mention it in the producers, so it's springtime with Hitler. It's just... Mel Brooks plays a bad Polish actor who has to save the day to... bring... get out of Nazi Germany, should, in a nutshell. You should really turn the light on, dude. I don't know why you turned it off, but you're, like, invisible. You wanna see my belly? I'll show you my belly. Mr. Mike? Mr. Mike? Can you please get to the part where you talk about how Doc Brown is a Nazi in this movie? <sighs> Alright, so... Like, the, the plot is simple, but there's a lot of key moments where it's funny where... Christopher Lloyd's in this film. <laughs> he plays a Nazi. And he's the dumbest Nazi you've ever seen <laughs> in your life. It's like, I don't know anything about that. And his name is Schultz, so... <laughs> Uh, the colonel's like, Schultz! Schultz! Because he fucks everything up for the Nazis, apparently. Um, it's just... I was like, Christopher Lloyd, what are you doing here? <laughs> Something weird and random. I mean, like, nowadays, it's really unsurprising to find Christopher Lloyd in the most unexpected of places. Like the Piranha movies. Or freaking Oogie Loves, where he plays the bongos in a flying sombrero. Mm-hmm. And he, and he has a cute Chiquita with him. Why can't we go back to the classy Christopher Lloyd days where he was in Suburban Commando and Baby Geniuses? Oh, oh, taxi. Those were the taxi. days he had dignity. Taxi, taxi, he was good in taxi. Chris Reloid, we should have talked about more about that, um, <laughs> otherwise. This is just really obscure, it's, nobody knows a lot about this film, I just picked it because, there's a couple of reasons why I picked To Be or Not To Be, because first off, it was about World War II and Nazis, and that kind of played back to the producers, which kind of connects everything together. Um, it's an 80s film from 1983, and <laughs> this I just found out in research, there is a song that's on the soundtrack but not in the film called To Be or Not To Be parentheses The Hitler Rap. Great. No. Really? Yep. And then it, Mel Brooks and then it, raps. They made a music video out of it too. Yes, there's a music video out there on YouTube. You can actually watch it. It's... I was like... I didn't hear that in the movie. Where... What? What? It wasn't as popular because he did a rap also in uh, history, uh, history of the world. Yeah, he did a rap back in '81 and that was successful. He's like, oh, maybe I'll do another rap for this film, and I've heard it. And I was like, okay, that didn't go well. <laughs> I'll try it again later. You gotta screw up once in a while, so. The Inquisition, here we go, the Inquisition, that's the show. You know, you're wishing that we go away. <laughs> that will be you never bad. know what to expect from the Mel Brooks Inquisition. The song was a music video tie-in for the movie, and it was released on a 45 single and vinyl. The song peaked at number 12 on the UK single charts during February 1984. In the same year, at number 3 in the Australian singles chart. So I guess it was popular in the UK and Australia. 
The song was banned from being broadcast on television and radio in Germany, making it a highly controversial and political sensitive single in that country. What? This was due to the treatment of Nazi involvement in World War II. And here I thought it was due to, like, some swear words. <laughs> oh, he didn't, he didn't swear in the song, so... Of course, swear words. <laughs> oh, it's, it's banned because... Who'd have guessed? <laughs> Who'd have thought a rap about Hitler would what? be so controversial? What? We don't want to air this on prime time, but it's for the kids! <laughs> no, we'll have Hitler on ice. Okay, now, hey, I know. Hey, no, ho, ho, ho. now I know why the song was banned. It's because the beat was terrible. That sounds like some really cheesy 90s commercial there. It sounds like it's... friggin' Vanilla Ice is selling Coke to us. <laughs> Coca-Cola, Coca-Cola. Oh, that is the finest of 80s music, mind you. Come on, that was 83. That was a classic. Uh... Hey, Maury, I've been so Now I can only imagine Hitler dressed up in a 90s, like, gangster style with, like, a baseball cap, like, sideways, and, like, some skinny jeans. Basically, basically, if ha if uh, Hitler was dressed up like the rapping dog in the animated Titanic movie. Hitler. God. Okay. The dog in the animated Titanic movie had none of the things you just described. Yeah, he had a bat, he had a baseball cap, like... Where, I don't like, think he did, side. actually. Yeah, he did. He did. He did. Well, he didn't have skinny jeans, that's for damn sure. Well, he had jeans. He had some kind of jeans. <laughs> nah, he didn't wear pants. He just had a jersey. He had nah. jeans. Look it up! If you don't believe me, look, look it up. Look up a picture. Look it up. Uh, like I said, it's To Be or Not To Be is a really underrated film, like... Because apparently, I mean... It's a remake of a 40s film, which I think is perfect for the 80s. Like, that should be, like, the rule. Like, they should be remaking stuff 40 years ago, not, like, this, like, reboot shit every two, three years. Like, Amazing Spider-Man. Wouldn't that mean that we would be remaking stuff in the 70s nowadays? Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Like, if they do the 40... 40 year rule they would be remaking movies from the 70s which I wouldn't they, mind they kind of do though like there's a couple here and there but not as much they're taking a lot from the 80s which I was like that's 30 years you could, could wait at least 10 years before doing marketing that off, I don't know, marketing I just... off of the generations kind of sucks and it's a remake like I actually want to see actually, I actually want to see the original just to see how it is because it is a true remake of the 1942 film, apparently, with I all the dialogue, but... Yeah, but the... There's a couple, like, character name changes, but otherwise it's... The dialogue's the same, and... But it's like, it's an 80s movie remaking a 40s film, which I think they've done a couple already in the 80s, which I kind of... Because a lot of 40s films... Who watches films from the 40s nowadays? It's just... I don't. Who doesn't? A lot of old school people do, but I just took on a whim because I love the. I, I guess Will Brooks has a thing for Nazism or something in his films, like How the producers and to be a Nazi. <laughs> exactly. I'm just like, hey, 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 what? Hey, 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 hey. It's either ironic or it's the reason. He's Russian Jewish. But still Jewish nonetheless. <laughs> so. Mel, you see, Mel Brooks actually does have a lot of good acting chops in To Be or Not To Be because he does play a lot of characters. Like, he impersonates two characters in the film trying to do, like, a con kind of thing to get out of Germany. So he's, like, trying to be some other guys, which is kind of clever how he's trying to... He's a bad Polish actor, but otherwise he's just trying to uh, be different. There's a, there's a line in the movie at the beginning where it starts off 
talking about the war, and then it goes into this theater, like, oh, Polish entertainment still going on. It's like nobody's affected by the war, and you see Mel Brooks and Anna Bancroft doing their shtick, singing a uh, sweet George. Georgia Brown in Polish and it's all in Polish and then it's like it, 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 where's, where's the English track where's the English track and all of a sudden the narrator is like from now on <laughs> from now on this film will be in English I was like what <laughs> just the narrator just says from now on this film will be in English it's like breaking the fourth wall there in a Mel Brooks movie so surprising. It's uh That's usually not his quote, style, you know. It's been quoted that this is his favorite Brooks Brooks films he ever did. So Van Bancroft. So mm -hmm. uh, It's 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 something if you're I don't know. I'm just I'm I'm a guy who just likes obscure shit and eighty stuff and if you... Oh, thank you. The heck? Thank you, stupid foe. Let's go, uh, time traveling. Mr. Mike, you know he also produced The Elephant Man, but wasn't credited because he figured people would think it'd be a comedy. Really? For real? Yeah. Dang. And the same thing for The Fly, too, with Jeff Goldblum. Yeah, he did produce The Fly. He, and like I said, he produced and starred in this film. He didn't direct it either, but it was just... I just thought it was interesting. If you're interested in watching a War II film, a, a war comedy film with Mel Brooks, it's something you should check out. It's on Netflix, and that's kind of what I do. It's like, if it's on Netflix, I watch it. And that's how I watch the producers as well. I was like, oh, the producers, I'll just watch that as well. Mm -hmm. What do you know? I think Netflix is my savior, so... If... Otherwise, let's uh, get into the uh, last, the very last Mel Brooks film from 1987, Spaceballs. Spaceballs. Spelled with ten L's. Mm-hmm. Yes, that would be my pick for the evening. So, Spaceballs, I believe, is probably the very first Brooks film, or Mel Brooks film, uh, that I that I saw when I was a uh, when I was a wee lad when I was a little wee tood, and uh, it it's strange it's strange because I acknowledged it for what it was it's it's a, a spoof on Star Wars and a little bit of Star Trek. All the uh, science fiction and space movies, pretty much. It's his take on. Sp science fiction space movies like how it's silent silent movies silent mm -hmm. and westerns with blazing saddles and horror comedies with young frankenstein yeah this is just another one and i think um i'm i'm sort of torn between this one and and young frankenstein as being my favorite mel brooks film because um this one like i said saw it first but i still but I still acknowledged it was a spoof, and I think most of the jokes went over my head when I was a kid. the The plot of this movie is uh, very is uh, we have an a galactic a galactic empire that calls themselves the Spaceballs, uh, run by the president's uh, President Scrooge. Uh, his lackey, Dark Helmet, who, <laughs> yes, who is obviously a Darth Vader uh, mm -hmm. clone, played by played by Rick Moranis. The legendary Rick Moranis. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh my God. I yes, where where book. where are you, sir? Where we need you again? Please come back. He he retired. He's like doing stuff. He retired. God, though. What was the like the only, the latest movie that I could recall from him is probably Brother Bear, and Brother Bear Two. Oh, oh no, and his voice work so. That counts. Mm -hmm. But yeah, yes, they go around the galaxy stealing air wherever they can because they don't have much, they don't have very good air of their own, and. Uh, 
they tried to they tried to kidnap the princess Vespa of a of a uh, local of a nearby planet that um, uh, that has a lot of really good air, a lot of really good atmosphere, conveniently enough. And the only one that can that can save her after she's run away from being from her own wedding is Lone Star, uh, a character who's uh, who's part Luke Skywalker and part Han Solo put together. Um, and he's got a and he's got a sidekick who's a half man, half dog, played by John Candy. Another man who may he rest in peace. Mm-hmm. Little dog, half man, half dog. My own best friend. Yeah, this 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 movie just has a amazing amazing cast here. They, we've already mentioned Rick Moranis and John Candy. There's also um, Bill Pullman plays Lone Star. Yeah, and like he's Bill not Pullman. not dumb people. Yes, and Mel Brooks, of course, uh, in a in a dual role here, playing President Scroob and and yogurt. Yogurt. The, yeah, who's a parody of? Yeah, it's quite obvious. It's a yeah. He he's shrunk he himself down for this movie. Yeah, of course. Like, who couldn't forget that he was doing a he was doing a parody of Spock. Mm-hmm. What, that's Matt. It, it's the ears, Matt. you know. Matt, obviously he's supposed to be Dumbledore. Come on. <laughs> Everybody. Oh. Knows. Oh, now I see there's others, of course. And let's not forget, um, Dom DeLuise as Pizza the Hut. Uh... See, I loved that when I was a kid, because when I was a kid and I first saw Star Wars, and I was introduced to Jabba the Hut, I was like, his his name is like Pizza Hut. You know, because that was the only context in which I knew the word hut. So when Spaceballs made the joke, I was like, they get me! And then you have the Max Headroom reporter going like, In today's news, Pizza the Hut apparently died by eating himself after being locked in his own limousine. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so one, one of the best... One of the best payoffs in the movie right there. But, um... Yeah, Joan they... Rivers. Joan oh, Rivers Joan Rivers... How, oh, how, I, I feel bad. How could I, how could I have missed that joke? This is like Michael Winslow's in some film. This is like her. What are you, Hollywood? This, well, this is like her, her only good Hollywood movie role. You know. Yeah. I, I could be wrong about that, but. Uh, oh, uh, oh, oh, there was Dick Van Patten who recently passed away, unfortunately, as King Roland. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he did. It's kind of ironic. Yeah, they. Uh, it, it was funny. I, I watched the. I watched this movie. It was uh, the day after I watched it. They announced that uh, Dick Pat Van Patten died. So I'm. I'm, I'm yeah. gonna have to start watching what movies I watch from here on out, or what episodes I get requested for from pages to pictures, because. Um, I, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm jinxed, you know? Timing. Well, but, you know, it, um, adds to the, it adds to the topical appeal. Yeah, but it's not necessarily a good thing. If it's people you love, then, like... Oh, no, no such Jinx. thing as... Oh, no Jinx, if you want, like, just in case, if you have that power, ne uh, in your next uh, From Pages to Pictures, talk about a new Bay Bowl movie. <laughs> How they're based on video games, not novels. You... If he has the power, he'll find a way to turn around it. I'll have to. Uh, well, you just spoiled it. Um, I actually had this new spin-off idea called "From Pages to Pixels." Uh... Oh. Wouldn't that be video games based on books? Maybe. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's right. From pixels to pictures. Anyway, yeah, there we that's go. what it Pix is. Pixels to pictures. There you go. That's what that's. Oh, that's. You are welcome. Okay. <laughs> oh wow. I've got an eight-bit. I've got an eight-bit instrumental theme mixed out and everything. <laughs> oh shit. No. So. Oh, 
Um, in all seriousness, though, the uh, this is this is just a, a, a laugh a minute movie with uh, with with space balls. You you don't uh, it even if you're not too familiar with with uh, Star Wars and Star Trek or science fiction period, you could still get a lot of the jokes. I mean, they mm-hmm. have. Um, right. Oh yeah. The, one of the one of the biggest quotable moments in the in the film, I think, is when they're they're trying to the uh, the the ship that's run by Dark Helmet is firing away at the at uh, Princess Vespa's escape vehicle, and they keep missing, and the the gunner turns around and he's got buckeyes. He's like, "What's your, what's your name?" And the is uh, Colonel Sanders. Colonel Colonel Sanders, the the colonel that's right below him says he's an asshole, sir. Yeah, but what's his name? No, that is his name, <laughs> Sergeant. And and then it goes all around the ship. And like, how did how did he get word? His cousin got him on the ship over there. He's an asshole too, sir. How many <laughs> assholes have we got working on this ship? Ow. Yeah. Everyone on the ship stands up and salutes. I'm surrounded and by assholes. I knew it. I'm surrounded by assholes. Fire assholes. Honestly, I always laugh the loudest at the little jokes. Like I think the one that I found the most amusing was just the bit where Dark Helmet was talking about who how there's only one person who could be standing against me where the camera pans closer and closer to him and he goes lone star and then the camera goes clunk falls down (laughs) so simple but so funny yeah if i may add one thing about uh space balls what i really find interesting is that a lot of people can look at this and say like oh this is obviously a comedy just through the characters alone uh, like the characters and settings and all that kind of stuff. But the really interesting factor about Spaceballs is that for me, I don't really feel like this is much of a comedy, uh, a parody, but more of it, its own own original piece. Like it's only, it's only the the characters, and it's only like a little elements that they just parody, like Star Wars and stuff like that. The rest, it's its own. It is its own element. It's its own thing, and that's what I really like about Spaceballs is that it really does give um, its own identity instead of just being passed off as a Star Wars parody. Like, even though, yes, like, even if it is considered a Star Wars parody, like, it's a really good Star Wars parody, but I really do love the factor that it has its own ID more than it is... um, I'm trying to mock another movie. Instead, it's just being its own movie, which is very rare when you see like, like you know, parody movies like this because that's what they're mostly focused on. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, that's that's one of the that's one of the great things about uh, looking back on it is that that's one thing you can get out of it. It it's it's not like. It's it's not like Young Frankenstein where you're, de- where you're debating whether or not the film is actually canon with the the Universal films or if it's a spinoff or what have you. This is something. This is something with its own story, even though it's not a highly original story. Yeah. But just one that sort of parodies story tropes, as it were. Are you listening to music, Mike? Or are you going to take a picture of us? <laughs> Shush. Take, take Shush. Last longer. <laughs> Wasn't gonna. I just had my phone for my timer. But uh, Spaceballs was actually the first Mel Brooks film I saw, actually, to be honest, as well. It's Mine, too. Yeah, I think mine as well, it's... actually. I think, I think Spaceballs was like probably the first film, Mel Brooks film we have seen as a it's just because I like guess it was released on connected. our during our time period. Yeah, it was eighty seven, so it was like, you know, it was because um, 
even though Blazing Saddles and Young Frankenstein were popular enough, but the thing is that um, Spaceballs and Robin Hood Men in Tights were a big hit in video sales. Adaptations. Like, it was like... It was, it was riding so, the top of the Star Wars higher. Are you kidding? There was no way it wasn't yeah, going to become well-known. Exactly. So it's just people know Spaceballs and a lot better. And it's so popular enough, we got an animated series out of oh, it. Oh, yes. I, I've I heard remember about watching... It. <laughs> yeah, I was just like, wait, an animated series? What? I'm aware of its existence. I never watched it. No, I never watched it either. It was. Told it wasn't very it was, good. Uh, it was on the then channel G4, and it was just like a random. I am guilty of seeing all three episodes of the show. Back then, it was on. I kind of didn't think much of it, aside from, oh, it's great they're doing a space film show. That's fine. But looking back on it now, it's just a one-trick horse. Every episode is a parody of something, even if it is dead. Like Pirates of the Pinkers. I mean, Pirates of the Caribbean. Sorry, I'm stuck on the movie. Um, every ship disaster we've ever made, like Titanic or The Towering Inferno or Poseidon, uh, American Idol. There's even a whole parody on Spider uh, Man, done as Spider Mog, where, where Barf becomes like this Spider Man version of himself. And it just seemed like the episodes were, again, a one trick horse. They were just taking. Yeah. Like, Parodies that were already done before then and doing it again. Hell, they even do like a whole episode uh, based on the Star Wars prequels where they show the origins of the Dark Helmet. So now, why did why did you watch all of them? Because I was innocent back then and I saw Spaceballs in the title. I am ashamed. Yeah. It's easy to get like oh. suckered in. Yeah. Especially yeah, like um... looking at it right now, like just through the art style, I feel like. <laughs> It, it, it looks like... Uh, how can I put this? It, it, it looks like... Yeah, it looks very... It looks very Flash animated. Y you know, like... Actually, the art style, it, it really feels a lot like something out of Go Animate. Like, for those of you, <laughs> like... That old, like... Um, like, cheap animation, animation software that, like, you make your own dumb videos with and it's, like, crap as hell. The only uh, yes. the, the only positives I give the show for is that they got Mel Brooks and Joel Rivers back in their original roles. Everyone else, different cast for obvious reasons, but... No, the, each... they did get a, a Daphne Zuniga. I, they got her back as a Princess Vespa. I forgot about that. Yeah, yeah, she's actually really good in the film, too. She later would be in uh, The Fly 2, I think. Yeah, The Fly 2. Yeah, it was Fly 2, because I was just like, oh, I noticed her. She was in, she was pretty good. As, um, it's very quotable. Spaceballs is very quotable. I, and I uh, I love the uh, fourth breaking the fourth wall jokes, especially where they're trying to find where Lone Star is on, on, on that desert planet, and they're like, we got a copy of Spaceballs. <laughs> yes. <I'm... laughs> I'm... Oh my god, that whole bit, that was whole bit. I love that, because they open the video uh, shelf they have, and they have all the Mel Brooks films previously, plus they have the other <laughs> videos there. Um, but it takes it, puts it in, and it's like, let's fast forward through this, fast forward through this, and you get to see all the bits already happening. When does this happen in the movie? Now. You're looking at now, sir. We'll go back to then, we can't, because right now. When will then be now? <laughs> it was just so <laughs> That's the fourth wall joke oh, I've ever yeah. seen. <laughs> um, but Mel Brooks does play President Scrooge, which is actually uh, Brooks spelled backwards, if you didn't notice that. No, I did not. Clever. Or no. It's, it was very clever. <laughs> it's just, uh, there's a scene where he's um, going to be teleported to the next room, and he... Or has to be going to the next room, and he's like, oh, "Can I be teleported?" And then it's just like, "I have to go in the teleporter, like from Star Trek." And he goes in the t teleporter and into the room, and he, his molecules got mixed up, so his head was on backwards. And it's like, D "Why didn't anybody tell me I have a big ass?" <laughs> Chew your gum. <laughs> yeah, and that, that, that was actually a reference to the twins who are double mint uh, twins. I'm Charlene. I'm Marlene. Like ooh twins, I like twins. 
but then he uh gets teleported back to the room back to normal and then it's the, the payoff gets better where he just walks and the door opens and it's the room right next door to his office it's like why did you why did you teleport there to begin with you could just walk in <laughs> just walk in just hilarious <laughs> And we did mention about Spaceballs in the past because John Hurt actually makes a cameo in this film oh. doing his bit from oh, Alien. No. Not again. The alien scene. <laughs> the alien scene is just so... And he does that bit yeah. from Looney Tunes Only with that frog thing. Like, like that <laughs> just, it's the most beautiful one. It was like... Film. Spaceballs has a lot of the kind of... Spaceballs hits a lot of those comedic notes that the scary movie movies and their, like, descendants try but fail miserably. You know, like with the alien yeah. scene. I could see mm. that alien scene being done in a scary movie sequel, only, you know, badly. And without John Hurt. Because hell if John Hurt's touching that. You know, the funny thing is, they didn't you know, have Spaceballs. Parodies. They, they, they want to be Spaceballs, but they can't. Yeah. It's ironic you say that oh, because of course they, they did. That... Yeah, they had the John Hurt thing. He busts out of his stomach, and as it turns out, it's a rapping alien. Oh, <laughs> goes full circle. It goes that's rapping it. in that's the eighties. That's exactly what would have happened in a scary movie movie. He would have the alien would have popped out and then busted into like LL Cool J. It's exactly what would have happened. Yeah, yeah I think you mean in. Movie. I think you mean. I think you mean in a spinoff. Uh, what, uh, the, the, the deal with, uh, and, and I'm gonna, I'm not gonna, uh, bash too much on Scary Movie 1 and 2, because I actually like those, but, um, I think the, I think that the, uh, the phase, or the second phase of satire, which we saw happen as a result of those movies. Uh, brought to us by the bastard, Miss Southern Greenberg. Um, uh, they. You guys are frozen up. Uh, are we? Uh, uh no. Well, I mean, no, I mean, not, not, not on my end, but. Frozen up. That is you that's having issues, not us. Okay. The problem is yourself. Uh,. The problem, the the problem is those movies they they have no self identity. Spaceballs does because it has its own story, minus superhero movie, which which tries to be its own thing. Well, the superhero movie to... was made by different people. Yes. No, that's the that Jason Kiefer that and Aaron, Aaron Seltzer thing. Mm hmm Yeah, superhero movie. I actually yeah, got a few laughs out of. They didn't do superhero movie. Yeah. I know. Which is why it's better than the others. But is it really saying much? Yeah. Uh, so. No. Um, there is uh, there is also one more thing that I probably have to mention, going off on spaceballs. Um, the. Uh, just so recently, the longtime rumored sequel which was mentioned in the film as a gag it well it uh it it looks like mel brooks wants to go forward mm -hmm. well, yeah, okay it's well talking. if it's mel brooks it's, it's, it's well, looked he, like mel brooks, he, he's mel brooks has been talking it, about going forward with it since space balls like uh, yeah no he's, real new development there yeah. the, the key is he's been talking about it. The key, if he can get Rick Moranis to come on retirement, is the key. If he can do that, then the movie's going to be going Cause, forward, cause but right now it's in talks. Otherwise, fuck that. I'm not watching Spaceballs sans Rick Moranis. He's like the best part of the movie. Mm hmm. Exactly. Wouldn't be the it's, same without him. So, and that's what Mel Brooks said. And if he can get Rick Moranis to come back to do the film, it. it he would do it. Honestly, just, but it's, it's not very likely. It's not. It's not. It doesn't sound like it. It's for, for what, what I know, because Rick Moran is doing his own thing. And... 
that's fine. You know, Spaceballs doesn't need a sequel. It's it's stand on its own. Yeah. It, I, Mel Brooks hasn't made sequels I mean, to any of his other movies, I don't think. No. No. Mel Brooks, Mel Brooks said he wanted to do a sequel to, to do like a like a parody on the prequels of Star Wars. That's what that would be it's, Spaceballs it's... 2 would be, basically. See, prequel From parody hear, would it's... be like magical because there's too much low hanging fruit there, you know? Well, no. And well, it's not it's... hitting on the classic button in the same way. It's more no, just, no. you know. But keep in mind, like I said. Spaceballs, it's more it's is more its own thing than a parody. The only element that is a parody is just the characters themselves. That's pretty much it. So like I, I can like, see it work. I feel like that's the reason right. it wouldn't work, because if it tried to like tackle the extreme well known punchline that is the prequels, then it would just it would get lost in that. And it wouldn't be this, yeah, as self contained I mean, and as focused. Especially what, I mean they could parody I mean that's the thing with Spaceballs too. They would have he would have to do like a, I mean I'm sure it is its own thing, but it's in sense a parody of everything else we knew from the past when it comes to films. So if yeah, I, I say just... just focus less on the parody aspect and more be its own like a sequel to Spaceballs. I say we probably won't have a sequel anyway. Yeah, as yeah, best if yeah. yeah. It's Besides, just, it's just, yeah. it's, actually, it's better off to just... It's the rumor mill. It's better off to just leave it as it is. I know too many movies that are ruined by sequels. Yeah, you know, just... Let things be. Think about what a, a, a classic of comedy, The Hangover, would still be considered if it didn't get caught up in sequeldom. Oh, yeah. Remember that? Remember the days when The Hangover was considered, like, a future classic comedy in the making? And then 2 and 3 happened, and now it's it's gone. Or remember back when Shrek was such an icon for non like he is he was the icon for non Disney animation and then Shrek the Third happened. This isn't this doesn't even just apply to comedies. Remember when The Expendables was considered a classic in the make? Like oh my God, this is such a unique and special thing. We'll remember it Probably. forever. Five sequels later, uh, that movie's okay. By the way, sorry, I just um, Morgan did say that he would. Allow us to do it, so. <clears throat> Is Morgan sleeping? Who's your friend that's always there? Ding pong, ding pong! Just, just, just keep playing it up, Morgan. Just keep playing it up. Just, just keep blowing static into my earphones. It's fine. <laughs> Anything else on space balls? <laughs> Um, I think that's a sign we uh, need to start wrapping it up. Give, give, give me a second here because I want to do this is for them. Obviously, since Terminator Genesis is coming out uh, Wednesday. No, Genesis. 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 Since, since the new Terminator film's coming out uh, pretty re recently here, I figure we talk about the franchise as a whole, all the four films, and bonus points for if you guys actually go see it. For research for the episode but yeah next time on cinema royale we are going to talk about the terminator franchise and just a heads up after terminator we'll do our tribute to james horner can we talk about the sarah connor chronicles yes speaking of, the, speaking of the devil i, I am got it on DVD. game i am for this shit so we're, we're doing terminator next time yes we are doing t the terminator in other words, this has been Cinema Royale. Thanks for watching. Make sure you click that like button. Comment below. What's your favorite Mel Brooks film? What's your favorite quote? Give us all the goodies down below. Uh, subscribe for more Cinema Royale. I'm working on making more videos on the channel, so subscribe for more content. Uh, <laughs> all these lovely people have their have their own stuff besides Jada, because Jada is exclusive to this podcast. So if you want to see more of her, subscribe because it's the only time you see. You're gonna her. get a dozen subscribers today, my friend.
Like, oh man, we have no other Probably. options to see this gorgeous icon. I feel like my mind was just violated by a panda bear. Well, you can't say no to panda. Cat, well, technically, it's uh, part cotton candy, part elephant, part, part, cat, part cat, and part, part dolphin. dolphin. <laughs> and until next time, hasta la vista, baby. We'll be back. Not now. Get out. It's ciao over. for now. It's over. Get on with your lives.